Welcome, everybody, to the Christopher Dana Reed Foundation's Live Better series. I'm Rob Girth. I'm the director of digital media here at the foundation. And today we are talking power soccer. And we are lucky enough to have a whole handful of experts with us today uh, that you're going to meet in a minute. But first, we're going to do a little housekeeping. We are going to have Q&A at the end, and you're going to be able to do that through the chat feature. So here is our operator, Susan, uh, with the details. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please use the chat feature located in the lower left corner of your screen. And as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded today, Wednesday, July 31, 2013. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. And now here is our host for today. That is Dan Humphreys, and he is from Blaze Sports America. Dan, take it away. Uh, thanks, Rob. And first, I'd like to thank the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation for providing this platform for us to highlight some different team sports throughout the year. And today, of course, we're uh, featuring uh, power soccer, one of the adapted versions of the world's most popular sport. And I'm happy to say we've got uh, three people who live, eat, and breathe power soccer today with us uh, to provide this information to you. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I would like to turn it over to Barb Peacock, who will uh, give you a little list of her credentials, and uh, we'll go through and uh, introduce the three experts we have in power soccer, and then we'll get into the presentation. So with that, Barb, thank you again for joining us, and uh, I now turn it over to you. Well, thank you for having us today. Um, as you said, my name is Barb Peacock. I've been involved with power soccer since the early 1990s when the country had only seven or eight teams, all of which were in California and Arizona. The game was completely different back then, and I've had the wonderful experience of watching it grow and develop during the past 20 years. From the late 1990s, our local sports organization of Arizona Disabled Sports hosted all of the teams for the Rules Committee meetings. These were the precursors to the United States Power Soccer Association, or the USPSA. In 2005, I was one of the U.S. representatives who traveled to France to begin discussions with seven other countries to develop an international form of the sport. And in 2006, the Federation International of Power Chair Football, or FIPFA, was born, creating a whole new version of power soccer, also called power chair football. And the U.S. quickly adopted this exciting new style of play and subsequently organized the USPSA. Since then, I've continued to coach and or team manage several of our local teams, and I've remained active with FIPFA as well as with Arizona Disabled Sports. I'm a retired teacher, and I hold a couple of degrees. Uh, next, we have Gabe Trujillo, one of our excellent players. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gabe Trujillo, and I am the team captain of the Sun Devil Power Soccer Club here in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I began playing power soccer in 2005 uh, during an experience uh, coming across power soccer while on campus at Arizona State University. Uh, I've been playing uh, since then uh, with the Arizona Disabled Sports Program through the teams that they have available, um, and I am currently, like I said, I was on the Sun Devil Power Soccer Club. Uh, currently outside of the court, I am a digital specialist at a company called Digital Airstrike, where we do online marketing for uh, companies across the country. Uh, as far as my education background, I just recently earned my master's degree from Arizona State University in American Media and Popular Culture. And also, I earned my BA in Journalism from the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at ASU. So on top of my marketing credentials, uh, I also hope to become a freelance journalist as well. Uh, let me go ahead and introduce you to uh, my teammate, Jordan Dickey, who will also be talking about the sport as well. Hey, um, I'm Jordan Dickey, and I'm 20 years old. I'm originally from Pendleton, Indiana, and um, I first started power soccer in 2003 with um, Sudden Impact. And that was 10 years ago, and um, I fell in love with the sport right away. The last couple of years, I played with the ASU Power Soccer Club at school, and in 2005, as a seventh grader, I was in a part of Sports Illustrated called Faces in the Crowd, and that was a cool experience, and it just highlighted local athletes and amateur athletes that had excelled in their sport. 
Um, I'm currently a junior at ASU studying business management. And in 2011, I went to Paris with Team USA and there, along with seven other athletes on Team USA, we won the World Cup. And now Barb's going to see what we're going to talk about today. Okay. Our, our objectives today are very simple. We want to present a dynamic team sport to you. We will explain who can play, the equipment that you're going to need, and the current rules. We will also quickly present some information about classification. We will then give some personal testimonies as to the benefits of playing power soccer and where you will be able to find further information. Okay. Who can play? Basically, anyone who uses a power wheelchair in their everyday life can play power soccer. There are no restrictions as far as age, and the teams are comprised of boys, girls, men, women, all ages and backgrounds. For safety reasons, though, everyone needs to be able to drive the wheelchair with control. Um, people diagnosed with severe physical impairments that involve permanent limitations, including but not limited to the conditions on this slide, would qualify. Currently, Currently, the, uh, as far as classification, there is a current classification system that's used for international competitions. At this time in the USA, we're not using any sort of classification system, but some athletes have been classified so that they can participate in international competitions. For example, if a team wanted to travel to Canada to play in a tournament, all the players on the team would need to be classified under this system. Um, the wheelchair, the fitness level, the age, the cognitive abilities, gender, skill level are not factors in the classification system. The assessment totally focuses on the functional performance of the athlete in relation to power soccer and his or her ability to play the sport safely. Classifiers look at trunk and head control, reflexes, fine and gross motor movement patterns, and one's fluency of movement. The athletes are then classified as PF1, PF2, or PF3. PF1s, well, this classification system is far and away more complicated than what I'm presenting here today, but I just want to do a quick overview. Um, in a nutshell, PF1s have a significant level of physical limitations. These players typically have minimal trunk strength and head control, limited field of, field of vision, and may require more strapping for stability and safety. PF2s have a moderate to mild level of physical limitations and are typically able to control their head and trunk somewhat. They're more apt to be able to turn their head, increasing the visual field on the court. PF3s are typically physically able to use a manual chair and could easily participate in other wheelchair sports. So they are deemed ineligible to play internationally, but can definitely play within the U.S. system. Um, the athletes are all classified a minimum of twice, more often if they, if they have surgery or illness or some medical reason that might change their ability to, to uh, their classification. And athletes with a degenerative condition would be classified more than once. When enforced, a minimum of two PF1s must be on the court throughout the match. Okay, now Jordan is going to go over uh, the... Sorry, Jordan, I skipped your beautiful slide. There we go. <laughs> Jordan is going to give us a brief overview of the equipment that you will need to play. Okay. Um, those were just a few pictures of me playing in the World Cup. And we beat um, France in the semifinal with the host country, and then England in the final. And it was a lot of fun, and it was a great experience. Okay, now to talk about the equipment. There's a few basic elements that every game needs. Um, a standard basketball court, and it has to be completely level, which almost all basketball courts are. Um, then a 13-inch soccer ball, which you can see in the picture. It's um, larger than a regular soccer ball to 
for comparison, and larger than a basketball, too. Um, power chairs must have at least four wheels, and no scooters are allowed. Um, a seat belt is necessary, um, and other strapping is allowed, but is not required. And then foot guards, which you can see is the silver part on my wheelchair in that picture. It is, um, that's what we use to hit the ball. And then goal posts, which are tall and sturdy. And then floor tape to tape the goal box and other important areas on the floor, which we'll, give, we'll talk about later. Okay, and the next slide, the wheelchairs, is what I will be talking about. The, there used to be, everyone would use their everyday chair to play soccer. The sport has evolved greatly, and now almost everyone has a everyday chair and then a soccer chair. The preferred soccer chair used to be the Quickie P200, or an Embicare chair, like in that picture. But now, Power Soccer Shop, which is the main business that goes along with Power Soccer, has created a chair specifically for Power Soccer, and you can see that on the bottom right. Today, it is hard to be competitive without one of these chairs in the higher divisions of Power Soccer. And in the top right is another picture of example of a ball that we use. Next equipment is the goalpost. The goalpost must be tall and sturdy, but movable just in case a chair hits them. Sometimes goalies or defenders have to go full speed to block a kick or a ball that may be about to go across the goal line, so they cannot slow down to not hit those posts. So those posts need to be able to move out of the way. Cones are okay for goal posts in scrimmages, but not for um, very competitive tournament play. And then guards are another essential part. It, there are many different kinds. Plastic, which you see at the top, are for beginners and cheap compared to the metal guards you see on the bottom. The metal guards um, are generally custom made and now Power Soccer Shop is beginning to make guards that fit almost on any chair. These guards are many differences. The metal ones are needed to be competitive at high levels because the ball moves at such a great pace and you need to be able to keep up with that game and be able to hit it hard yourself. And then on to the rules about the guards. The guard cannot be um, has to be between two and five inches off the ground from the bottom and cannot be longer than 13 inches past the front wheel facing backwards. That may seem confusing, but if a person in a wheelchair just backs up, their front wheel turns, and then you measure from that front wheel to the front of the guard. This is so that a, another player doesn't have a competitive advantage to hit it harder with a longer guard. If a player's feet stick out beyond the guard, then an additional four inches is allowed, as you can see in the picture. The side plates in between the front and rear wheels are necessary to, rent, to prevent trapping of the ball, which can become dangerous where the back wheel may run up on top of the ball. But with new technology, that has almost been completely eliminated from our game today. Now on to the rear part, rear guards on the wheelchairs. Rear guards are not necessary, but many players have them. They have many of the spa same specifications as the foot guards. Besides, the guard cannot extend more than two inches past the furthest part of the chair. And then as you can see in the bottom picture, the front and rear guards cannot be wider than the widest part of the chair and narrower than the um, front casters. This is also to prevent trapping or creating too large of chairs. Um, this all may seem confusing in a diagram, but once you see the sport, you understand that everyone has the same 
ability or same um, guards and make it just even play for everyone. And now Gabe is going to talk about the rules for the other besides the equipment. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, now I'm going to go ahead and cover some of the basic rules for power soccer. I could be here and talk to you for hours on the rules, um, but right now I'm just going to try and give you a brief overview so that way you can have uh, a general understanding of how the sport is played. First thing we're going to cover is the field of play. Uh, like Jordan said before, it's played on a standard basketball court, um, but the measurements do have the ability of being expanded or minimized. Uh, as you can see there on the diagram, the width can be a maximum of 59 feet uh, while also having a minimum of 46 feet. Uh, so again, uh, it's generally a standard size basketball court, um, but there is the option of uh, expanding the field of play uh, if need be. Similar to able-bodied power soccer, uh, you have your center mark, which signifies the halfway line uh, for the field of play, and you'll also find uh, a goal box similar to the able-bodied sport uh, with the goal area uh, identified with the goal post as well. Uh, the goal box is actually bigger than the goal itself, um, so that way uh, there is some more ability to uh, maneuver within the goal box. And then the goal posts uh, will signify the area in which the ball needs to cross in order for a goal to officially be scored. Inside the goal box, you'll find the penalty mark. The penalty mark is used uh, for infractions that uh, require a penalty kick, and this is the spot where all penalty kicks uh, will be taken uh, if there is a foul or if there is uh, the possibility of overtime where we need to go through uh, penalty kicks. And also similar to the able-bodied sport, we do have corner kicks. And as you see on the diagram there, uh, there are corner triangles on the corner of uh, each corner of the field of play. And it is where we have the uh, corner kicks uh, during set ball times. Now some more basics of the rules. Uh, the sport involves two 20-minute halves. Uh, if tied, there will be a five-minute as overtime played in succession. Uh, during this overtime match, and there are penalty kicks, um, a shootout can also be used to determine the winner. For the each team, there is four players on the field. Uh, one of them is designated as a goalie, so you generally have three players who play on offense, and you'll have your one designated goalie who will sit inside the goal box. The one interesting part about the sport is, is that the goalie can actually play the entire court. Uh, there are a few teams who do have a designated goalie, but play him on offense. Uh, this takes a little bit more teamwork and practice, um, but it could be a useful strategy uh, if you do decide to uh, bring your goalie and play him up. There are no timeouts involved in the sport. Uh, when there is a substitution that needs to happen, uh, it oftentimes occurs during stoppages of play. So, for example, if a ball rolls out of bounds uh, and a team needs a substitution, uh, the assistant referee will then uh, raise his flag to notify the head referee that a substitution needs to be made, and at that time, the sub will enter the game and take the place of the current player who is going to be coming off the court. And uh, as far as referees are concerned, there's going to be one center referee and two assistant referees, or ARs as we like to call them. And for the assistant referees, uh, there will be one on each side and they will be responsible for uh, monitoring all these steps that occur uh, on the sidelines. Before each game, uh, both teams are required to have their players undergo speed tests. And uh, in order for this to uh, occur, uh, there are speed testing uh, sites uh, near the field of play where every player will go through and make sure their t chair is within the uh, allotted speed limit. For the current sport, uh, we have to ensure that our chairs do not go more than 6.2 miles per hour and uh, if they do go faster than the designated speed limit, 
uh, they will be unable to participate uh, in the current match. At the end of the match, uh, the referee will select one player from each team to go ahead and get speed tested again to make sure that there were no uh, changes in the speed test. Uh, and for example, say the game ends and one of the players who was selected ends up testing faster than the designated speed limit, he will then be uh, given a red card and be forced to sit out the next game. And then the team that the player was on, they'll end up forfeiting that match. Now, when you put the ball into play, there are several ways you can do that. Uh, first off is the kickoff. Uh, this occurs uh, during the start of the match and uh, after uh, a goal has been scored. The kickoffs for uh, our sport are taken at center court just like the uh, able-bodied uh, sport of soccer as well. Another way of putting the ball into play is with the corner kicks. Uh, this is awarded to the attacking team uh, when the defense knocks the ball over their own baseline. Uh, and this is just another set piece that is involved uh, within our sport that is similar to soccer as well. Uh, the ball can be placed anywhere inside the corner triangle. Uh, so a lot of times the referees will ask the player who is doing the corner kick uh, what their preference is. Uh, I know some of our players uh, like to put them uh, on the far corners closest to the sideline just to ensure that we can get uh, the most out of our spin kicks. Along with corner kicks, uh, we also have goal kicks. And these goal kicks are awarded uh, to the defending team uh, when the opponent knocks the ball outside of the goal line. And then once the goal kick is awarded, uh, it is placed at the top of the goal area where the defending team will then uh, kick the ball off uh, to their uh, teammates or just uh, down the line towards the center court. And finally, the kick-in. Uh, this occurs on the sidelines, uh, and then the kick-in is awarded to the team who has their player that didn't touch it last. Uh, so for example, uh, if the ball goes to the team that didn't knock it out of play, uh, that team will then be awarded the kick-in and can then uh, regain possession for the ball on the sideline. Now, along with passing, uh, maneuvering the ball is a big part of our game as well. Uh, the ball is considered dead uh, if the ball uh, is uh, kicked up in the air a maximum of 20 inches. Uh, with the way the sport is currently evolving, uh, we do have the ball that bounces quite high sometimes. So uh, while we are maneuvering the ball, uh, if the ball does happen to bounce up in the air, uh, well then it will be considered dead at that time. Now, when the ball is alive during play, uh, it can be spin kicked, uh, pushed, or handled by any part of our wheelchair. Uh, so that is why uh, many of us use both front and rear guards, uh, like Jordan was talking about earlier, so that way we can make sure we have uh, the highest maneuverability possible when we are dribbling the ball around the court. Now, one of the primary uh, fouls for the sport is called two-on-one. Now this occurs when two teammates uh, are within uh, three meters of the ball uh, when the ball is actively engaged in play. Uh, so the way I like to think of it is if one offensive person is dribbling the ball around the court, there cannot be one, two defenders within a three meter area of the person dribbling the ball or the team with the two defenders uh, will be um, receive an infraction of the two-on-one and will then uh, force a set ball uh, for the offensive player. There is one exception for the two-on-one rule, and this occurs inside the goal area. Uh, when there is action going on within the goal area, there can be a two-on-one involved when the goalie is involved in the play. So for example, uh, team is on defense, uh, there can be a two-on-one in the box if it is a defender and the goalie. Um, if there is a chance where the goalie is outside of the box and you end up having 
two uh, regular defenders go into the box and an offensive player pushes the ball in the area of these two players, uh, they will be uh, called for a two-on-one and the uh, offense will then take possession of the ball. One of the other main things to realize uh, inside the goal area is three in the box. Now, we like to uh, think of this as uh, a rule in which you can have only two defenders in the goal area at one time. Uh, this allows the ball to be a little bit more freer and the action to be a little bit more fast-paced. Uh, the goal area is uh, pretty small, so we can't have too many uh, players rolling in the box or we'll just have uh, complete chaos. Uh, so with this rule, uh, there can only be two defenders in the box at any given time. Uh, so as you can see here in this picture, the third defender is sitting outside of the area, and if she were to go into the box, uh, she would then be called for the three-on-one penalty. Now we'll talk about the direct free kick. Uh, these free kicks are awarded uh, when there's incidental ramming, uh, clipping, or blocking uh, that happens during the play. Uh, a lot of times a free kick is also awarded when a player is reckless uh, or has uh, a spin kick into another player uh, this direct free kick is also uh, gives the offensive player the ability to score uh, directly from the kick itself. Uh, and as you can see here uh, in the slide, when the referee points uh, in a horizontal motion uh, after the free kick, uh, that signals that the player has the opportunity to score the goal uh, without having to have the ball touch another player. Now, along with direct free kicks, you have indirect free kicks. Uh, with these free kicks, uh, they occur most often when there are two-on-one infractions, uh, three in the goal area infractions, um, or uh, on the rare instances when a player fully crosses over the goal line uh, between the goal posts. Uh, some other instances occur um, when it, the process of an opponent is impeded or when someone deliberately moves or pushes over a goal post. Um, now, uh, in converse of the direct free kick, uh, an indirect free kick, uh, the player needs to uh, have the ball touch another player um, before it can be considered uh, active and scoring a goal. The set ball that I was talking about earlier uh, is awarded when uh, the ball elevates over 20 inches um, with the way the sport is going now, um, if the ball does bounce up higher than 20 inches, uh, the ball is immediately identified as dead, and a set ball uh, is then called uh, right where the um, ball bounces uh, in the field of play. Uh, the ball is trapped between the two players uh, with no movement for more than three seconds uh, to signify the set ball, and it could not be determined which team knocked the ball out of the play. Uh, set balls, like I said, are taken from the spot of the incident, and the ball must touch another player uh, in order to score a goal, uh, similar to the indirect free kicks. Now, there are a wide variety of fouls that can occur during the, the play or during the sport as well. Uh, some of them include ramming. Uh, ramming is basically when a player is uh, a little bit I guess, aggressive during their play where they actually ram into another opponent uh, and cause uh, significant uh, jostling uh, with the player. Uh, so a lot of times the, the referee will call ramming uh, if he does deem the play to be a little bit aggressive. Uh, clipping occurs when uh, a player is dribbling the ball down the court and a defender comes and misdirects uh, the player's uh, direction of which he's dribbling the ball. Uh, so say, for example, a player is dribbling the ball down the court and a defender comes up from behind and uses his guard uh, to push up against his wheel to sort of uh, direct him to go in a different direction. Uh, a lot of times the referees will call this uh, infraction clipping. And also, uh, one of the other major fouls is blocking. And blocking uh, is essentially just like 
it sounds. Uh, if a player uh, goes up to another uh, opposing player and blocks them from either uh, coming out of the box or uh, blocking them from giving the ability to get the ball, uh, they will then be called with blocking and then um, the other team will then be awarded the ball. Uh, on the rare cases where ramming is severe, uh, the referee has the discretion to award the player uh, a yellow card. Um, most often, the player will receive a warning from the referee before getting a yellow card. Um, so if he is warned and he continues on uh, with the aggressive ramming uh, and does uh, continually hit opposing players, uh, the referee will then give that player a yellow card. And just like in able-bodied soccer, uh, if they are awarded uh, two yellow cards, they will be then given a red card, which will result in that player's uh, ejection from the game. Now, uh, penalty kicks I briefly touched on earlier, um, but penalty kicks occur uh, when there are fouls within the goal box uh, or uh, during overtime when uh, penalty kicks need to be decided to determine uh, the winner of the game after the overtime uh, has uh, gone through. And like in, in the field of play diagram we looked at earlier, uh, the ball is placed at the X uh, penalty mark inside the goal area and that is where the player will uh, take the penalty kick. When the penalty pick, kick occurs, uh, one offensive player will take the kick uh, against a goalie. And as you can see in the picture there, uh, the goalie must be sitting behind the goal line and has to face forward. Uh, this way, uh, the player has as much opportunity to score the goal as much as the player uh, or goalie has the chance to stop the play as well. Uh, one thing that you do need to remember if you are a goalie for a penalty kick situation is that you cannot move the ball or you cannot move until the ball is struck. And then once the penalty kick occurs, uh, the ball is considered in play uh, if it does rebound back into the court area. So, for example, if a penalty kick occurs uh, during the regulation of a game, uh, once the kick happens and it bounces back into the field of play, uh, it is considered a live ball, so then all players can uh, try and attack the ball to score a, a goal after that. Now that was just a, a brief overview uh, of what the rules uh, occur for a power soccer game. Uh, now let's go ahead and turn it back over to Jordan as he discusses some of the benefits of power soccer. Um, I've been an avid sports fan since basically I was born. I was brought up in a sports crazed household even though two of my siblings are also disabled which is a good picture to use for this slide because they also play power soccer and they are in this picture. Um, but I always wanted to play a competitive sport independently and I, I tried challenger baseball and that just didn't provide the competitiveness I needed. It, in that, everyone won, and everyone did a good job, and stuff like that. And I, while, while I enjoyed that when I was young, I still was looking for something more competitive. And um, in PE, PE class, I always played with my friends, but I wasn't able to do everything they were able to do. And um, so I found power soccer. I was very shy, and my mom made me go to power soccer, and I cried on the way there. It's kind of embarrassing, but I cried on the way there. And she made me go, but I loved it ever since. And um, I've been playing ever since. And it's just something that I can do independently and um, fulfills my competitive spirit. And my friends are able to come and watch, and they, they realize that it's a very competitive sport, and it takes a lot of skill. And um, they're able to come and watch and see that I'm that I'm good at something. And uh, through this, I've also found so many new friends. I've been all over the U.S. to 12 different states, from Arizona to Pittsburgh to Florida and California and all these places, and even to a different country in France. 
And so I just met so many people, and um, it's provided that competitiveness for me and brought me out of my shell, I guess, of shyness. And um, it's opened new horizons, horizons for me, too. I I wouldn't be, out, be at ASU without um, a tournament that we went to when I was in high school, and I saw the campus and fell in love with it and realized that there are power soccer players there, too, that love the sport, and and um, it's really just changed my life and my whole family's life. And now Gabe's going to talk about how it's benefited him. Now, when I came across the sport of power soccer, uh, it was all the way back in 2005, um, before I became confined to a wheelchair, um, I was your typical average um, child. I enjoyed playing sports. Um, most of my early years were spent in Little League and playing soccer, so I was an, an avid athlete, and sports were a, a big part of my life. Uh, so when I became confined to a wheelchair uh, at the age of 14, uh, I thought my days of being an athlete were pretty much over. Uh, I have heard about several different adaptive sports, um, but none of them really seemed to fit me and to what fit what I wanted to achieve from having sports. Uh, so this one time in 2005, uh, I was actually a student reporter for Arizona State University uh, doing a sport uh, analysis on uh, quad rugby. And at that point, uh, they also brought up this sport of power soccer. Uh, so they gave me the information, and I ran over to one of their recent practices, and from the moment I saw them strap on a guard and started dribbling the ball around, uh, I realized that this was a sport that I wanted to be involved in. So uh, in 2005, uh, after learning about power soccer, I immediately became involved with the sport uh, I joined Arizona Disabled Sports uh, here in Phoenix and uh, joined one of their power soccer teams that they had and quickly realized that this sport was exactly what I was looking for. Um, the first and primary thing that I wanted to get out of being a part of any sport was uh, the ability to be competitive. Uh, I, I've seen a bunch of stories about other sports and um, they just didn't really feel like they had uh, the chance of being able to uh, do my competitive spirit. Um, but once I realized what this sport was all about, uh, I realized that this gave me the perfect opportunity to be competitive and be that athlete that I was looking for that I thought wasn't really a possibility uh, when I became confined to a wheelchair. So being a part of power soccer allowed me to be part of the sports world that I didn't think I could be. Uh, I had dreamed of being a sports writer and participating in sports as a, I guess, uh, a fan of it. Uh, but now, seeing that all the things that Power Soccer has to offer, I'm able to actually become an athlete and participate in an exciting sport that not only uh, allows me to experience soccer in a way that I never thought possible, but it allows me to uh, be that athlete that I was uh, searching for and wanting to become even though when I was just a child. Uh, like Jordan said earlier, uh, being a part of Power Soccer has allowed me to meet a lot of new people. Um, I've made a ton of new friends, and uh, along those lines, I'm able to participate in team sports, which help you uh, build your communication skills. It allows you to... Uh, see how other people are getting involved with the sport and encourages people to come out of their shell and experience sport in, in a completely different level. Uh, like Jordan said also, it allows you the opportunity to travel. Uh, I know there are some people who uh, are afraid of traveling or just haven't had the opportunity. Uh, if you do participate in power soccer, uh, you're able to travel across the country, uh, attend uh, different tournaments, uh, in different states, and then if you are lucky enough to uh, be in the higher echelon uh, competitive uh, parts of the sport, uh, you can then also travel overseas and across the globe uh, in uh, competition as well. Uh, so 
it, it's definitely allowed me to find that competitive spirit that I thought was lost uh, 15 years ago. Uh, and I am extremely grateful for everything that the sport has offered me, um, not just as an athlete, but uh, as a person with a disability. And it's allowed me to realize that uh, sports is really something that uh, can still be a big part of my life. Awesome. Thank you, Jordan and Gabe. <clears throat> as, as you can see, the overall benefits are numerous. They're varied and personal to each person and situation, but on the whole, essential to creating a sense of normalcy and equality in one's everyday life. The opportunity to play a team sport, a highly competitive team sport, is a universal benefit. With that comes team building skills, increased confidence necessary for the world of work. Camaraderie is built in and sportsmanship skills are learned. Making new friends and traveling around the country for tournaments is the icing on the cake. If you've been disabled your whole life, power soccer can bring you new challenges and experiences that you cannot get from other sports or activities. And if you were active in sports and became disabled, power soccer can bring back that competitive spirit that maybe you have been missing. Um, officially, the USPSA has, uh, was organized in 2006. This past season, there were, were over 425 registered players in the U.S. We have a tiered system with five conferences, the top being the premier, next is champions, then the presidents, and the founders. And the fifth conference is a non-competitive conference with a lot of beginning and recreational teams. Um, the season runs basically the school year from September through June, with the top four conferences each having an annual cup competition in June or July. Each of these has each of these conferences has ten teams and the teams move between conferences by finishing the season um, and the cup competition with the top two teams moving up into a higher conference and the bottom two moving down. Currently there are over sixty teams in the US. Um, there's more teams being developed each year. We've grown from eight teams Oh, like 12, 13 years ago, there was only eight teams, and now we have over 60. We're looking forward to much more growth in the future. We visit MDA camps and hold clinics in prospective cities to try to get some, uh, some kids to join us. And uh, if you would like more information on power soccer in your area, please contact us. We like to do clinics, and we will come and help and give you as much information as we can. Um, the organization to contact would be United States Power Soccer Association. And on the slide here, you can see the president, current president is Dominic Russo. And you can email him at president at powersoccerusa.net. would be the best way to get information. Uh, the contact phone number, 866-928-9009. And his address in Indianapolis is 8465 Keystone Crossing Drive, Suite 160, and that is in Indianapolis at uh, zip code 46240. We have a great website at www.powersoccerusa.org, where it also gives you, um, you can download the rules, the constitution, you can see on there the different teams. Um, and everything that's happening currently in the USA as far as power soccer is concerned. So I guess, uh, Dan, are we opening it up to questions? or We are opening up to questions. None have come through the chat line, but I have a few questions uh, that uh, some of our uh, uh, webinar participants might be interested in. Um, obviously, there's, uh, the Arizona State University has a power soccer team. Are there any other universities that have organized power soccer teams across the U.S.? Uh, Ball State does in Indianapolis. Um, Gabe, are there others? Uh, there are currently no uh, other officially uh, recognized power soccer clubs. Uh, as far as I know, uh, the ASU club and the Ball State club are the only two uh, officially recognized uh, power soccer uh, club sports. Um, but I do know that uh, there are several within 
uh, the universities uh, inside those areas that um, do uh, offer pop power soccer for uh, students who would like to get involved with the sport. Excellent. Um, this question comes because uh, obviously I'm based in Georgia and Shepherd Center has a power soccer team and uh, and uh, we just recently I saw a video of one of the one of the players on the Shepherd Center team that uh, had gotten one of the power soccer specific chairs and it was a video of him doing a spin kick and it looked like that ball was moving about 100 miles an hour so. <laughs> Uh, we saw that the, the chairs have a maximum speed in competition of uh, 6.2 miles per hour in a straight line, but once you get that uh, the, the foot guard on there and you move it out to its maximum distance, how fast can you spin kick a ball? Do, do, has it been measured? Um, I actually believe they measured it. At, there's a power soccer camp, and they were just messing around, and they got a um, speed thing, and it was actually around... 35 miles an hour, I believe. Oh, my so gosh. So it does get moving pretty quickly. That, why I tell you, and, and for those of you that, that haven't had the opportunity to watch a, watch a power soccer match, uh, when, when uh, you get someone with uh, a tuned-up chair uh, that gets to do a penalty kick, it's hard to defend that. When that when, if you can get a ball moving 35 miles an hour, um, that's, uh, yeah, that's pretty much a goal if you've got some accuracy, wouldn't you say? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, it's one of the disadvantages to the goalie. <laughs> <laughs> well, your teammates have to be smart and not commit a foul, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, now, another question I had is um, uh, you talked about classification, and uh, we've got the international classification system, and obviously our players that want to make the international teams have to be classified to meet the eligibility criteria. But on a national level, the sport's opened up, uh, and uh, people who participate don't necessarily need to meet that uh, that uh, same eligibility criteria. Uh, have you found that uh, opening the sport up to more players uh, and players that may not have um, as uh, severe functional limitations has made uh, the the sport a little bit uh, uh, given it a little bit more level of high performance on a whole, which has led to some of our success with our international teams, do you think that's a factor? Um, I don't think so, not really. Um, I think it's allowed some more people to be able to play that couldn't, maybe they don't have wheelchair basketball in their town, but they have power soccer, um, that kind of thing, and some younger kids who possibly, you know, have a degenerative condition, they can play power soccer where they, you know, they might not, they couldn't classify correctly for international play, but they can play and then a few years down the road they would qualify. Um, but on an international level, I think that our, we've just really stepped up our game and have had success because of that. And the, um, the pop, that whiz-bang strike force chair helped out a lot too in the World Cup. <laughs> well, that well, it's, it's oh, God, I'm beat. sorry. It's hard to beat, but other countries are buying the chairs now too. So <laughs> um, that leads to my next question. And obviously, when we talk about it, any type of adapted sport equipment is always an issue: getting equipment, affording equipment. And uh, so, my question is: how much does uh, how much do those uh, power soccer specific chairs cost? Gabe. Uh, well, I guess the base model uh, probably runs around five thousand uh, dollars. So they definitely are a little bit pricey. Um, but one thing that we recommend uh, to all the people who uh, are interested in being serious about the sport, uh, they to give this Strike Force chair a, a try. Uh, and even though it does sound a little bit expensive, uh, one thing that we encourage those who are interested in purchasing one. Uh, would be to do some uh, fundraising, whether that's uh, online uh, or offline, um, and ask people to donate to uh, your fund for getting a chair. Uh, I know when I purchased one, uh, I set up an online fundraising page uh, to encourage people to uh, donate uh, to my uh, page to uh, try and uh, get a chair purchased. And I was able to raise uh, over $3,000 uh, to go towards the purchase of a chair. Um, so I know they're uh, not just me, but several other players uh, have gone this route as well. 
um, because they are serious about the sport and want to try and, and be on the uh, highest level of competition. Um, I There have not been, I don't see any other questions on the chat line, and those were the questions I had. We do have just a few minutes left. Was there anything else uh, any of you wanted to add uh, add to the uh, discussion? Uh, I have a, a question I'd like to add. Go ahead. Um, well, one of the things that uh, people are, that I've come across about power soccer is uh, they, they don't realize how uh, competitive a sport this is. Uh, they think of it as just uh, some other way for them to uh, be active and participate in a sport. Um, but I, I just want to convey the message that it's definitely a competitive sport. Uh, the teams that are uh, on the highest levels of competition uh, strive to be a national champion. Uh, every year we have a goal of setting our sights to uh, win the national tournament and do whatever we can to um, be, I guess, considered a, a national and global champion. Uh, so if somebody is looking for that competitive edge or competitive spirit, uh, I definitely recommend that they give Power Soccer a try. And I, I couldn't agree with you more, Gabe. Um, I've had the ability to watch, uh, see a lot of power soccer matches, and uh, I think it's very easy when you're a spectator of a sport to not be able to appreciate just how much um, how much uh, talent has to go into being successful. It's really easy to sit back and watch golf on TV and think, oh, how hard is that until you go out and try it. And the same is true of, of power soccer. And as I... You ask the question about spin kicks. You know, it, it's one thing to just spin a chair and hit a ball. It's another to spin a chair, kick a ball, uh, and get it to go exactly where you want it to go. And that takes a lot of time, effort, and practice. And uh, and power soccer really does offer uh, um, some great opportunities for those people that are looking uh, to be competitive, as as you and Jordan said. So I definitely hope that uh, um, the people who are watching this webinar, either live now or recorded later, um, that are looking for a competitive uh, opportunity, give Power Soccer a try. Uh, it looks like we did have a question come in. It says, uh, where is the widest point of the chair measured from, armrests or, or rear wheels? Um, it's generally re rear wheels. Rear wheels, um, okay. Yeah, the armrests, unless they stick out like very far, are not part of it. But if they are just a little bit farther out, then that's fine. Okay. All right. But, uh, with that, I think uh, I think that gives us just time to wrap up. So once again, Barb, Jordan, Gabe, on behalf of Blaze Sports, uh, thank you for joining us and introducing uh, the sport of power soccer to the masses. And uh, Rob, once again, thank you to Christopher and Dana Reeve for providing the platform, and uh, I will turn it back over to you. Uh, our pleasure. Thank you. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that this and other Blaze Sports presentations and also uh, some we, Blaze Sports is pretty much doing um, team sports for us and we have uh, another uh, uh, webcast that we do that talks about individual sports. We just did the last one last week on triathlons uh, and you can catch those at christopherreeve.org slash webcasts. I just put that in the chat. So it's christopherreeve.org slash webcasts. And uh, give me give me like 24 hours to get this one up there, and it'll be up there. But you can go there now and check out all the other ones, the past ones we've done. Thank you all. Uh, soccer is one of my favorite sports, so this was a pleasure to listen to. Well, thank you for the opportunity to get some power soccer out there. All right, and we'll see you guys next time. <laughs>